we just did a review video on the Hudson sawmill and now I've got some more questions for Ryan here about the idea of buying a sawmill to either first get it to pay for itself but then hopefully eventually to make it earn a living or a side income for you so what kind of luck have you had as far as making some money back off the mill I, I feel like it very much depends on where you're at what what your local market specifically looks like depends on how successful you you're gonna be it is a big trend right now that I'm kind of riding with the live edge wood in general that's that's 99% of what I do is live edge slabs uh, after we run them through the eye dry we've got a warehouse and we supply all of our local DIY guys and I say all of it that's wishful thinking plenty of our DIY guys locally and our custom uh, furniture makers so that in itself we're riding this kind of uh, you know the high side of this wave and it is very very fruitful when you're able to sell that much wood all in one piece for the guys that are selling two by fours and that and just to give you an idea if you're selling a two by four it's worth about five dollars some of these slabs like what you see behind us they're, they're bringing two to three and four hundred dollars a piece our local market's really good here in the Tulsa area so so you do not try to mill dimensional lumber or do some kind of bulk orders what you want is individual unique looking pieces of slab with live edge for someone who's trying to make something artistic or a tabletop or a bar yeah. or something like that yeah because you're getting more return for the time you spend on it exactly yeah yeah it's it's more volume volume is what you're selling when it comes down to making money selling wood i don't want to kind of try and dissuade anybody that wants to to mill for other people that'll always be an option but once you start um, getting an inventory built up with some unique woods and stuff like that you get an idea of what your local market looks like I think there's a huge draw or necessity to associate social media with this type of thing uh, it's very difficult to get word of mouth and that you know, cuz it's such a niche you know and people are intaking so much media on these river tables and tabletops and stuff like that that's already where they're at seeing it so that's already where it needs to be available at the same time if that makes sense so what I see from most of anything in this category if you're wanting to buy any kind of machine and then get paid to work with it the idea sounds easy and then it becomes much more difficult yeah I've talked to a few people who had smaller mills that were portable and no they thought they were going to be able to go to a person's house who had a, a log and and make money that way and they found it very difficult to get a real return on that yep. the two things that I see is what you're doing which is more unique pieces of wider slabs which mm -hmm. requires a different type of mill yeah. so you need to know that ahead of time or what Paul my friend Paul case is doing bulk customers that are using the same thing over and over again to make a product and they're just stamping it out and that comes down to what do you have access to they have access to log handling equipment and unlimited trees yeah. where for you you have to hunt down the right trees sometimes so it, yeah it's not just gonna come to you until you kind of get some some steam worked up but yeah you you've got to go pretty hard you've got to go and you've got to meet people and when it comes down to getting a saw guy or a saw company or a tree a tree company to work with you first what you got to consider guys is you're asking them to do something that's completely unnatural to their business they want to cut it up small enough where they can handle it throw it on the trailer and get it to the dump now it seems pretty intuitive that you could just go up and if that's a nice guy well he's going to help you out what it takes for a saw company to supply you with a usable log at six or eight feet long is far outside of their wheelhouse it is much more difficult for them to to deal with that handle that I mean they're just guys like you are you you can't handle that stuff be willing to drop their their brush haulers you know quick trip gift cards or come and go gift cards be that guy put put a hundred dollars in the in the saw man's hand be you know you're asking them to do do you a favor but it's gonna take them a lot of work to be able to supply you with what what you need most of them are going to think that what you're doing is fantastic and they're going to want to help you but at the same time it takes more labor to get what you need out of them their business makes your business so you need to be able to uh, make a gesture to those people right away to to make sure that they're first they're going to remember you 
and they're not going to look at you as there's this kind of pain in the hind end that makes our job harder because we're doing him a favor. So that's that's a really good little tidbit of information. I think that that is a good idea. And so now you've sourced a mill, you've purchased a mill that can handle the types of jobs you want to do, and you're finding the trees to work with. And the next thing is, even after you cut them, they're not necessarily ready to sell right away. Not even Just close. Everybody, most of your customers <laughs> want a product that has either been kiln dried or air dried for a long time, right? Yep. Most of your furniture makers, creators, whatever you want to call it, they're going to know, if you're just getting into it, they're going to know quite a bit more about what they want out of their raw material, okay? Um, and you'll, you'll get to the point where you're understanding moisture contents and stuff like that, which is really, really important. If you can get in with a local kiln service and kind of let them handle that portion for you, do that. But selling green means you're, you're selling it at the cheapest possible rate that you can because it's not usable material. It may take, depending on the thickness of that piece of material, it could take six months up to a couple of years to get to a usable moisture content. But even still, your real furniture makers and custom guys, they're not gonna touch your product unless it's been through a kiln and been bug killed and it's, you know, uh, uh, to a certain standard of that. And what they, what they mean by that is, let's say this is set here and, it, and it's air dried all the way down to a 10% moisture content or 12 and it's really usable but I can't guarantee that if I sell it to you in six months you got a pile of sawdust on the floor under your trailer because there's actually a bug in there still working on that wood so that's a huge thing no custom furniture manufacturer anybody wants to have to deal with that or or apologize for that for something that you've done and it's ruined their product so it's very important to get your stuff kiln dried it'll make you the most profitable uh, and you're gonna have the best product and once everybody kind of gets that word around that you've got the good stuff it's over they're gonna come to you they're gonna be a repeat you're that smiling face you're not a pain in the butt you've got what they need they can trust your wood it's over at that point so so the next question I have what are some species that you've found to be good for you that that work to get sawn and dried and sold my favorite and it seems to be really common in my area i'm in i'm in the tulsa oklahoma area just outside of tulsa oklahoma a lot of the neighborhoods in here they have these pin oaks it's a red oak species that's super common it grows really fast it has real sharp bristle tip oak leaves it drops a little bitty acorns and it's got a gray kind of tight skin to it bark um, you'll see it from a mile away once you kind of get your eyes on what you're looking for. That stuff has some of the most incredible grain patterns. Like if everything was trying to measure up to a walnut, this does that. For a local, you know, attainable, easily gotten, people will give those to you. That wood is absolutely incredible looking. It's got awesome grain patterns. It looks fantastic. My entire property is covered in pin oak. It's all three foot diameter. Yeah, yeah. And it's hard not to cut them all down, but I want to leave some. But that's what I'm stacking up at those, my house. Those are... So uh, walnut's probably number one, though. Absolutely. And yeah. then pin oak's another good choice. Yeah. Pin oak is number two in my sales because when people, DIY guys walk in the door, they get wiped out by some of the price tags of some of the material that I've got in there. And I always give pin oak as a number two option and they always buy. You have any idea what I could do with like a 35 to 40 inch diameter hackberry? Is that any good? Turn it into firewood? Chances are there's a big hole inside of it. So yeah, you could fill it with a bunch of epoxy. So you're looking at, at hardwoods. You guys have run across cherry or anything like that or? Cherry guys, uh, cherry's cool. It sounds cool. It's not as cool as it sounds to me. Somebody's gonna slap me around for this. I'm sure you're gonna catch some heat on this video. Cherry, the closest thing you could get to a saw guy is probably a wild cherry. And in my area, those are the, about the crookedest trees you could find in the woods. I've got some of them on my back fence line over here. They're beautiful. It's awesome wood. They cut awesome, but they're just, they're all over the place. You're not gonna get a, a really fantastic piece of dimensional lumber out of something like that. Uh, I just have had a lot of trouble. I'm a huge fan, but those are hard for me because they're so crooked. 
So in an ideal scenario, as soon as you cut that, you're taking it to a kiln? Or does it need to dry before it goes to the kiln? Well, there's a focus because you're going to have a long road ahead of you. So in order to make kiln drying, like I said, find that kiln operator in your local area and try and get in with them and use them, right? Where kiln drying costs you the most is when your material is too green. So uh, solar kilns become very handy. You know, even like, like what you've done, you put it in your shop with some fans, you can really accelerate the moisture content. What we want to shoot for is getting all the free water out that is free to get out. And then the last little bit we'll pay for. That's how you stay profitable in kiln drying lumber. So what? So you, you want to definitely stack an air dryer for as long as you can handle it. I know you're excited. You're going to want to just get it out and take pictures and sell it. You can, um, but really what you need to do is stack it and let it start air drying pretty quickly. So I noticed something with a couple things actually with the way yours is stacked that might be ways I can improve on what I'm doing first. You've painted all the ends of your logs before you cut them. Mm. And then you're stacking them and sticking them the way that I do, but you've got straps around them too. And I've noticed that all the tops of my stacks are bowed like crazy. So you're putting straps in there. Yeah, yeah, and along with the straps, it's there's the fibers are kind of shrinking as it dries as well. So there's a little bit of maintenance to your straps. If you're gonna do straps, you definitely need to come every four weeks or something like that and really crank them down. I do that just to keep the top ones honest. That's exactly right. And then um, the sun is also having an effect, So, but yours are not covered. Some people say to put a piece of tin across that. I never did it. Sure, I'm, I'm using my top piece as a sacrificial piece of board, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat, guys. There's no wrong way to do it. We have a predominant south wind. The wind is hitting me in the face right now, and you see my boards are all obviously stacked the wrong direction. You know, uh, if they were turned this way, the wind would be sweeping through them. I would be getting some of that free drying. And then the last, the last question that came to my mind is, how are you deciding how thick to cut this? What is there a, a, a sweet spot you found for what people want? Sure, sure. There's a sweet spots in different categories, right? You've got your DIY guys that are building charcuterie boards, you got your soccer moms, everybody wants that small stuff. And short enough where they could throw it in their Honda and take it home. So you need to have that smaller material that's always ready for those people, I think. I'm not telling you what to do, but I like to have a lot of smaller stuff. So as you're milling, it's tough to build the menu before you start cooking, you know what I mean? So as you're cutting through your cant or your log or whatever you're doing, I generally tend to cut a couple of one buys out of there or eight quarter pieces out of there and make sure that I've got at least a couple of them in my stack. That way when I stack everything up, I'm gonna have the bulk of what I do want, which is tabletops for me, but I've still got some of that DIY guy stuff. So charcuterie boards, name plates, wall hangers, welcome signs, that simple cool stuff, live edge that people really dig looking at. They can burn, you know, burn their name into it or whatever, you know, people go, they do amazing stuff, blow my mind all the time what you can do with this stuff I've never even thought of. So then when, when you know what you want, like there's like a three or four inch slab, you're thinking someone's gonna want this thick piece if you know you want to finish two inch, are you going two and a quarter, two at and least, three eighths? Yeah, two and a quarter at least. Um, if I know somebody wants two inch finished and I'm not real familiar with the wood species, I'll go even a little bit thicker because I don't know if it's going to warp. Uh, some of your trees like um, sycamore, sweet gum, they're going to be really easily attainable, but you're going to learn hard lessons on them because they do kind of crazy stuff because of the nature of them. Uh, once you guys get into saw milling more or you've got maybe a better machine than I do where you can quarter saw some stuff, then you can get some more reliable pieces out of those species. But like I said, if you're going to target uh, X thickness, you're not familiar with the wood, go a little bit thicker. Um, if you need to, you know, charge them a little bit less because you know the wood's going to behave a certain way that you're doing them a favor, they'll appreciate that kind of stuff for sure. And so to summarize it for me, is most of us are looking to just make a little bit of money and make sure that our mill can kind of pay for itself. Yeah. 
but I think you just need to be thoughtful about the mill you're buying and know that it's not going to be quick and it's not going to be easy. You're going to have a process on getting any returns out of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You, there's going to be a lot of brand new U's showing up in the world once you start to get in there because you're making new contacts, you're rubbing shoulders with different people. Maybe you're lucky enough where you're already in that world and it's just an easy slide right into the next position, but chances are you're new to it, you're in love with it, you're looking for other people that are in love with it too. And when you start to meet those people, you're building valuable relationships with people that like what you like, they have what you have, or they want what you have, or they have something that that helps your process out as well. We were talking a little bit earlier, none of my friends have the kind of coin in their bank for a mill and a kiln and a big warehouse and a you know a bunch of uh, solar kilns outside, um, but a handful of us together are really starting to get some, some, some steam built up in that regard, you know. And probably the number one thing is you need to love it because that's, it is going to take time. He's probably he's probably bored me saying that. Honestly, I don't have the best business mind answer for for the business side question. Of course, I wanted to make some money, but guys, bottom line is I love this machine. I love the mechanics of it. I love what it does. I love the sawdust in my eyes. I, I just dig it. I, I dig it a lot. It ticks all the boxes for me. Um, I have made the payment right out of my pocket before and it doesn't hurt my feelings i'm happy to have the machine it's like a really cool dirt bike that you know i get to play with yeah awesome well i appreciate you telling us about it i appreciate you guys taking time to watch and we'll see you on the next one see you guys